Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here, again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of JSBox Corel harmonizations. I'd like to apologize for not having uploaded yesterday. I got home from work very late and I was just too tired to put a video together. Um, so I am going to be doing a double upload today, so be on the lookout for a second video as well if you are following along. I know that some people are following along day to day, which makes me super, super excited. So apologies if I put uh, a bit of a damper on your, uh, I guess, uh, viewing marathon, if that's how you uh, go about doing it. Sorry, I'm just going to try and center my camera here. Um, today's corral has two possible titles. I've seen it referenced in two different ways because the corral survives without text. It has um, some varying theories regarding what title might be appropriate. Uh, the first and probably the more common of the two is Hail Jesu Christ, Mein Leben Licht, which translates to Oh Jesus Christ, My Life's Light. That's going to be the working title for the video, but also I saw this corral titled as um, o Jesu, du mein Brautigam, which translates to O Jesus, Bridegroom of my soul. So hopefully you find this video by the BWV number if you're used to referring to it by a particular name. All in all, this crowd's really fascinating. I had to, you know, do a couple of double or triple takes when it came to what exactly the key was when we were at a particular point in the chorale. Lots of mid-phrase modulations in this chorale and modulating over um, lesser common chords, at least in my experience. Nothing really unusual about it, just lesser common. Um, but we're just going to hop right into the analysis. It's a relatively short chorale. We should be able to get through it pretty easily. So uh, when sharp in the key signature, we start on B major, and interestingly, we end on B major as well. So uh, unlike some of the chorales that we might expect here based on the key signature and the ending chord being the dominant, um, this is actually a perfect authentic cadence at the end and the overall tonality of this chorale is B minor. We just so happen to start in the key of E minor and this is just a case where the key signature does not accurately reflect the key of the chorale based on our expectations of what the key signature suggests, right? It's often that in minor chorales Bach will omit a sharp or a flat. Oh, actually, it's mostly with sharps. No, is that right? No, it's mostly with flats, with a C, a C minor and G minor. We'll often see them with two flats and one flat, respectively. And here we're seeing E minor, or sorry, B minor with one sharp. It just so happens that we start in the key of E minor. So it informs the first phrase, but does not inform the rest of the chorale. We see a lot of interesting uh, tidbits throughout the chorale, though, in terms of visiting a bunch of different keys over a relatively small uh, a set of changes. Just It's very little real estate for the amount of harmonic activity that's going on. So we start off with 5, B major, and then we move to E minor, E, G, E, and that same B from before. We then have C, A, E, and A, which is 4, 6, A minor over C, passing 7th in the tenor. And then we have D sharp, F sharp, another F sharp, and B. B, which is B major over D sharp, that's 5, 6, and then we have E minor, E, B, E, and G. Everything straightforward so far. Then we're getting into our perfect authentic cadence. We have A, C, E, and F sharp. That's F sharp minor 7 flat 5 over A, which is 2, 6, 5. We know that Bach loves 2, 6, 5 chords, especially in cadential contexts. A little uh, passing uh, G here. A is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. And then we have B, uh, B, D sharp, and F sharp, which is our five chord, with a passing seventh in the tenor again. We had another passing seventh earlier. And then we cadence on E minor, E, G, B, and E. Tonic triad, root position. Okay, next phrase. Kind of interesting in terms of the way that I went about analyzing it and the way that I heard it. And I think that there is some kinship between these, uh, actually, there's, there usually is some type of uh, symmetry or formal relationship between the phrases in these uh, four phrase corrals, the ones that don't have a repeat. Um, it's interesting how the modulation happens in this particular in this particular section, but we do end in a perfect authentic cadence in the key of the macro tonic, right, the uh, B minor, uh, but we start by uh, modulating from E minor to what I hear is modulating to G major, but you might not hear that. Uh, you could analyze this entire section in E minor until we get to the B minor modulation, but this sounds undoubtedly like G major to me. 
And I feel like there's a lot of things contributing or a lot of factors contributing to that. This uh, descending G major line, this ascending G major line. Here we have an ascending G major line too, as well as uh, the alto sort of hearkening in or t uh, focusing in on that dominant uh, D, which is uh, you know the dominant of G major. But we start off with E minor, E, G, B, and E passing tones in the tenor and the melody before we get E, B, E, and G again. That's another tonic triad, and this is where I mark the modulation. Really, we have three E minor chords in a row here, so really any point could be the modulation, but I tend to err on the side of modulating as late as possible because unless there's a compelling reason to say one of these E minor chords was where we modulated, there's no real reason why one is any more uh, prevalent of a point. Uh, before it. So in the key of G, this is our sixth chord, and this is a pretty common pattern we see in box six going to F sharp, A, D, and uh, A, which is D major over F sharp, which is five, six, six to five, six to one, G, uh, G, that same D, and uh, B, which is our tonic triad. Then we have a bit of a modulate. Uh, like a, a modulation zone, that's what I've been calling them in the videos, because uh, G major and B minor, there are multiple chords that they have in common, and to me, I don't really think it sounds like G is the point where we modulate, because we go to a D major chord, D, F sharp, D, and A, which is just another five chord, and we would expect that to go to some type of uh, tonic a triad, right? But instead we go to B minor, which for all intents and purposes does share two tones in common with G major. It's just it has an F sharp in it rather than a G. So the destination is not an illogical one. It's actually one we see with some frequency in Bach. But we have this passing C sharp here, which is kind of interesting from an analytical standpoint because it makes me feel like this D major chord is where we modulate. So it is kind of interesting to modulate over a subtonic seventh chord. Some people would even call this chord a, um, a non-functional harmony because we expect to see the leading tone in a seven chord, but we see them both used and uh, it really just depends on context here. Uh, but yeah, I think this is the subtonic seventh that leads us into our tonic B minor, B, B, F sharp and D. This chorale is chock full of interesting progressions like this. And actually, if you really wanted to get super granular, we have C sharp, F sharp, E, and A, which is F sharp minor 7 over C sharp, which would be a 5 4 3 chord in lowercase. I don't know exactly if this is contributing too much to it. I really feel like these tones are just sort of connecting the D and the F sharp and the the D and the B. So they're just bridging the gap between the two similar tones here, the two Ds, and then sort of branching outward. So whether or not you hear uh, an F sharp minor 7 chord in inversion um, on this uh, very weak beat, that's up to you. Um, I feel like, you know, when there are two voices moving, especially when one of them is the bass, it makes a compelling argument that maybe there is a subdivision going on. But maybe there isn't. I'll leave it in there just in case. Uh, we have two very stable chords leading to our tonic. But I see really just the overall gesture here being um, subtonic seventh going to our tonic, which is an interesting progression, kind of an older world sound. But afterwards, we get F sharp, B, F sharp and C sharp, which is our five chord. Notice how we have another four three suspension here over the bass. Not another because we've had one in this chorale, but rather Bach often uses four three suspensions over the bass over dominant chords. That seems to be a pattern that he likes when they're in root position. This E is a very brief passing seventh before we cadence, not on B minor, but B major, uh, B, F sharp, D sharp, and B, which is really interesting because typically when Bach cadences in the key of the mi uh, the minor dominant, uh, when it's in the middle of the chorale like this, it's not uncommon for him to use a Picardy third and then modulate back to the key of E minor. Um, but he doesn't modulate to the key of E minor. He modulates to the key of D major. And uh, it's kind of interesting how he goes about doing that because here, based on what you uh, see, we have... Uh, B major going to E minor, which is 5 going to 1 in the key of E minor. But if you look at the tones that continue into the rest of the 
the chorale into the next phrase, you'll see that it's very clearly not E minor with all of the, you know, the E sharps, the D naturals. The C sharps could imply E minor, but not in this context, and G sharp as well. So we see a lot of chromaticism. We're not going to be going to the key of E minor, even though the uh, chord change here might imply that. Um, we're actually going to be ending up in the key of F sharp minor, but in a similar fashion to how we go from G to B, we're going to be going from D to F sharp. So there's that same mediant relationship between the two keys, um, and that's what I think ends up being uh, the theme between the middle section of this chorale. So E minor, I don't think that we have five going to one in the key of E minor here, even though it sounds like that. That's sort of the big picture. E minor is still going to be our four chord in the key of B minor, but it's also going to be our two chord in the key of D major. And with this passing seventh in the bass, it takes us to C sharp, A, E, and, um, oh goodness, E, which is five, six. And then we would expect that to be, uh, or take us to a D major chord, D, A, D, and F sharp. Notice the big distance between these two voices as well. Typically, voice leading, uh, someone who teaches voice leading or harmony would tell you that there shouldn't be more than an octave between any two adjacent upper voices, so tenor, uh, alto, and alto and melody. But here we have a tenth, which is pretty interesting. Um, then we have a, that's still our tonic triad. Um, and we're looking for a point in which we modulate to the key of uh, F-sharp minor. And here's a really interesting thing that creates the symmetry between the, these two phrases. We have passing tone here in the tenor, and then we go to A major, A, C-sharp, E, and E. Five chord in uh, root position, very similar to the progression we saw here. Five, six, one, five. And if you look at the chord that we have on the next beat, we have uh, e sharp fully diminished seventh over G sharp, which is uh, a chord that's very clearly in the key of F sharp minor or implying F sharp minor. So I think we have another case where we're modulating over a five chord, turning into um, uh, another, not necessarily unusual, but like I said at the beginning of the video, unlikely, where now we're modulating over the median rather than the subtonic. Uh, and I'm actually just realizing now that this isn't the seven. This is also the three. So if you're if you've already typed a comment and submitted that, uh, sorry, I'm just realizing now these these chords did sound like uh, they were similar to one another in terms of how they were functioning and how they fit into the key. So apologies for analyzing it that way earlier. This is definitely a mediant, not a subtonic. So apologies for for inciting any confusion there. These these two chords are the same. I don't know why I'm, I called that a seven there. I think it's because I was thinking about E minor rather than B minor. But regardless, our three chord is going to take us to uh, kind of an, an interesting place, I guess. I think what comes after the three chord is what's more interesting, or after this chord is more interesting. Like I said, this is E sharp, fully diminished seventh over G sharp. So that's seven, six, five with the full symbol, not half half diminished, fully diminished. And then we go to, we would expect to go to F sharp minor, but we don't go to F sharp minor. We go to A, C sharp, F sharp, and uh, C sharp. No, we do go to F sharp minor. What am I talking about? So sorry, my notes are not correct in this matter. So this is actually not as interesting of a progression as I was hyping up. This is just three going to seven going to one, which is just what I've been calling a transitive progression. Typically we expect seven to go to three in a cyclical fashion. Seven goes to three and then we can follow down by fifths until we get to the tonic. But if we use that same voice leading, three can go to seven because seven going to three and three going to seven uses the same voice leading. They're just moving in the opposite direction. And then seven being a dominant chord can go to one. So that's what I mean by transitive. It can go both ways. Um, but yes, this is a tonic triad more specifically in first inversion. And then we have C sharp, G, F sharp, and B. Of course, because these two phrases are very similar to one another in terms of how they operate, it makes sense that the cadence is also similar. So C sharp, G, F sharp, and uh, B. This is a five seven chord. Let me make that five look a little bit more like a five. Um, and uh, by the time it resolves, it's actually now the B is still being held, so yeah, this would be some type of 5-7 chord, and then our imperfect authentic cadence would be in the key of F-sharp minor, 
with our tonic triad F sharp C sharp F sharp and a so sorry for that confusion both here and here I thought it was kind of interesting that he used two different chords but no they sounded very similar in terms of how the phrases operated in and around their own respective keys so that seven made it into my notes I think because I was thinking about E minor and D would be the subtonic seventh to E minor but here we're moving to the key of B minor uh, which is a less common key for G to move to definitely um, so it was just something on my mind a bit of a slip um, but the last phrase is equally interesting. It doesn't really compare um, to the other phrases in terms of the key relationships, but it does, uh, I guess, where the modulations occur and the structure of the phrase is similar to the previous two phrases because we are going to see another set of mid-phrase modulations as well as some distant modulation. So a place that I guess you know we could expect F sharp minor to go to is E major which is the next key um, we start off with D D F sharp and A and kind of for the same reason why it feels like this phrase is in the key of G major I feel like this is still in the key of F sharp minor despite this phrase looking like we're sort of play like we have like a plagal progression in the key of A major right D major to A major. It just looks like F sharp minor to me with the A, B, and the C sharp in conjunction with the F sharp, the G sharp, and the A. So I'm going to call this D major chord hour six. Then with these passing tones in the upper voices, it takes us to, th to three, another transitive progression, A, E, A, and C sharp. Uh, kind of similar to how this progression here leading into the third phrase was one to four rather than five going to one in the key of E minor and then saying this E minor chord was now two in the key of D major. It didn't quite sound like it had transitioned here. It just kind of feels like uh, it ends with the Picardy third and then if the context continued in the key of E minor that's when I would have modulated but two chords I don't really think that that really constitutes a modulation this is sort of just like a cheeky tonicization that's separated by a uh, phrase ending a cadence uh, but this three chord here is going to be our gateway to the key of E major which is considering the fact that we started in the key of E minor kind of interesting that we made it around the circle of fifths to E major and that's actually kind of what we've been doing right we started with one sharp continued with one sharp got the two sharps continue with two sharps got the three sharps continued with three sharps now we're in the realm of four sharps but instead of continuing in that actually we do kind of continue in that direction because cadencing in the key of B major would be like cadencing in the key of five sharps but this is undoubtedly uh, B minor for sure it's just a convention for him to end with um, a Picardy third in his minor chorales. But in the key of E major, this is our four chord uh, A major, and that takes us to G sharp, F sharp, A, and D sharp. Kind of an interesting chord, but this G sharp is an accented non chord tone. This is actually F sharp minor, or sorry, D sharp diminished in first inversion, which is seven, six. Very common chord progression, four going to seven. And we would expect that to go to one, which it does. And uh, this uh, G sharp E, because the G sharp is being carried over from earlier, E, B, and E spells a tonic triad in first inversion. I suppose there is an argument to be made that we are in the key of uh, maybe E minor, and we're just playing with the idea of mode mixture here, but I think this sounds like E major to me. And also, the more that I think about it, continuing around the circle of fifths, you know, uh, sh adding a sharp uh, incrementally, kind of makes sense that we're moving to E major from F sharp minor. And also the keys are closer in relationship to one another. It's much less common for Bach to move from one key to the next when they're distant, even though Bach is about to end the chorale with a distant modulation. So you'll see that proportionately speaking, you'll see maybe, you know, like 20 or 30 uh, uh, neighboring modulations where we're moving to a relative key or a key that's adjacent to the key that it's modulating to on the circle of fifths in comparison to a distant modulation which is like the one that's about to happen so this e major chord is actually going to be recontextualized as our four chord in the key of b minor as you can see we've sort of pivoted from a phrase that sort of looks like e major both in the bass and in the melody here with this ascending either melodic minor or ascending e major phrase to on the 
downswing and on the the upswing here in the bass to something that looks like B minor where we have the G sharp, the A sharp, and the B. Uh, so we have 4, 6 going to A sharp, uh, C sharp, C sharp, and E, which is A sharp diminished in root position. That's a 7 chord in passing. All of these are non-chord tones. And then we get B minor, B, D, C sharp, and D. Um, and this C sharp is a 9 8 suspension over the bass. He does that often with tonic triads. Um, but yeah, it's still our tonic triad. Uh, it just resolves on the next beat. But the bass stays the same, so we can just write the Roman numeral the way it is. And now we're closing in on our perfect authentic cadence. We have E, G, B, and uh, C sharp, which is another 2 6 5 chord. C sharp minor 7 flat 5 over E. Uh, we know that Bach loves 2 6 5 chords, especially in cadential contexts. And uh, C sharp is a chord tone. Uh, let's see, A sharp is not a chord tone. Uh, D is not a chord tone. Uh, G sharp is a non-chord tone. E is a chord tone. So um, those are all the non-chord tones that are happening there. And we'd expect that to go to a five chord, which it does. F sharp, F sharp, A, and uh, A sharp, sorry, and C sharp, which is our five chord. This E is a passing seventh again in the tenor. We've seen this in a lot of the uh, the cadences we've had so far. And then we cadence on B major, B, D sharp, F sharp, and B. Tonic triad, Picardy third. Most minor chorales end with a major tonic at the end anyways. And that is today's analysis. Lots of harmonic activity based on the way that I uh, analyzed it. Really, it seemed like one of may maybe the hallmark of this chorale is the mid phrase modulations that are all um, some type of median relationship between the, um, well, th let me be a little bit more specific here. The, the middle section of the chorale consists of chord uh, or key centers that are that have a mediate relationship not a chromatic median but a mediate relationship so g to b minor d to f sharp minor they're adjacent to one another on the circle of fifths but uh, if bach were to continue in this fashion he would be going from e major to uh, g sharp minor but instead he goes to b minor uh, g sharp minor would be um, actually the relative minor to b major but instead of going to b major he goes to b minor so he does end the chorale with some sort of logic the idea of b melodic minor being very similar to uh b major um kind of plays with that that idea so there is probably some intention here some craftiness definitely more harmonic activity than what i'm used to looking at in a chorale of this length um but other than the dist the, the mid phrase modulations the distant modulation at the end is pretty interesting as well the fact that we go from e to b minor b minor having two sharps in the key signature and e major having four sharps in the key signature but that's today's analysis uh, if you're interested in following me along on the journey to analyze all of box chorale harmonizations feel free to subscribe to the channel hit the notification icon and like the video if you enjoyed the content Thank you so much for watching the video, and thank you so much for supporting the channel by doing so. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis, and I hope you take care.